The Lord be with you. Thank you for joining me today, Wednesday, the 17th of August. We continue in 1 Kings. Today we will have 1 Kings chapters 7, 8, and 9. So let's hear the word of God together on this Wednesday, the 17th, and pray together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the word of the Lord from 1 Kings, the seventh chapter, verses 1 through 12, entitled, Solomon Builds His Palace. Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon, its length with a hundred cubits, and its breadth fifty cubits, and its height thirty cubits. And it was built on four rows of cedar pillars, with cedar beams on the pillars, and it was covered with cedar above the chambers that were on the forty-five pillars, fifteen in each row. There were window frames in three rows, and window opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and windows had square frames, and window was opposite window in three tiers. And he made the hall of pillars. Its length was fifty cubits, and its breadth thirty cubits. There was a porch in front with pillars and a canopy in front of them. And he made the hall of the throne, where he was to pronounce judgment, even the hall of judgment. It was finished with cedar from floor to rafters. His own house, where he was to dwell in the other court back of the hall, was of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken in marriage. All these were made of costly stones, cut according to measure, sawed with saws back and front, even from the foundation to the coping and from the outside to the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, huge stones, stones of eight and ten cubits. And above were costly stones, cut according to measurement, and cedar. The great court had three courses of cut stone all around, and a course of cedar beams. So had the inner court of the house of the Lord, and the vestibule of the house. So far the word of the Lord. Solomon's house takes almost twice as long to build, 13 years, as does the temple. An ominous foreshadowing of Solomon's shifting priorities. Too often we neglect the things of God in favor of our personal interest. Though the Lord will not have us ignore our home and comforts, he bids us to use all we have for the glory of his name, dedicating ourselves and all to the architect of heaven. May God, for Jesus' sake, refocus our attention on spiritual matters and glorify the great gift of salvation among each and every one of us. Let us pray. O triune God, we come to you for forgiveness and renewal in Christ. May we praise your name in all we do and say. In your name we pray. Amen. We continue in the seventh chapter at verse 13, entitled, The Temple Furnishings. And King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in bronze, and he was full of wisdom, understanding, and skill for making any work in bronze. He came to King Solomon and did all his work. He cast two pillars of bronze, eighteen cubits was the height of one pillar, and a line of twelve cubits measured its circumference. It was hollow, and its thickness was four fingers. The second pillar was the same. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. The height of the one capital was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. There were lattices of checker work with wreaths of chain work for the capitals on tops of the pillars, a lattice for the one capital and a lattice for the other capital. Likewise, he made pomegranates in two rows around the one lattice work to cover the capital that was on the top of the pillar, and he did the same with the other capital. Now the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars in the vestibule were of lily work, four cubits. The capitals were on the two pillars, and also above the rounded projection which was beside the lattice work. There were two hundred pomegranates in two rows all around, and so with the other capital. He set up the pillars at the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the south and called its name Jackson. And he set up the pillar on the north and called its name Boaz. 
and on the tops of the pillars was lily work. Thus the work of the pillars was finished. Then he made the sea of cast metal. It was round, ten cubits, from brim to brim, and five cubits high, and a line of thirty cubits measured its circumference. Under its brim were gourds for ten cubits, com compass compassing the sea all around. The gourds were in two rows, cast with it when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. The sea was set on them, and all their rear parts were inward. Its thickness was a handbreadth, and its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held two hundred baths. He also made the ten stands of bronze. Each stand was four cubits long, four cubits wide, and three cubits high. This was the construction of the stands. They had panels, and the panels were set in the frames. And on the panels that were set in the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. On the frames, both above and below the lions and oxen, there were wreaths of beveled work. Moreover, each stand had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and at the four corners were supports for a basin. The supports were cast with wreaths at the side of each. Its opening was within a crown that projected upward one cubit. Its opening was round, as a pedestal is made, a cubit and a half deep. At its opening there were carvings, and its panels were square, not round. And the four wheels were underneath the panels. The axles of the wheels were of one piece with the stands, and the height of a wheel was a cubit and a half. The wheels were made like a chariot wheel. Their axles, their rims, and their spokes, and their hubs were all cast. There were four supports at the four corners of each stand. The supports were of one piece with the stands, and on the top of the stand there was a round band half a cubit high, and on the top of the stand its stays and its panels were of one piece with it, and on the surfaces of its stays and on its panels he carved cherubim, lions, and palm trees according to the space of each with wreaths all around. After this manner he made the ten stands, all of them were cast alike, of the same measure and of the same form. And he made ten basins of bronze. Each basin held forty baths. Each basin measured four cubits, and there was a basin for each of the ten stands. And he set the stands, five on the south side of the house, five on the north side of the house, and he set the sea at the southeast corner of the house. Hiram also made the pots, the shovels, and the basins. So Hiram finished all the work that he did for King Solomon on the house of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowls of the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars, and the two lattice works to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars, and the four hundred pomegranates for the two lattice works, two rows of pomegranates for each lattice work to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the pillars, the ten stands and the ten basins on the stands, and the one sea and the twelve oxen underneath the sea. Now the pots, the shovels, and the basins, all these vessels in the house of the Lord, which Hiram made for King Solomon, were of burnished bronze. In the plain of the Jordan the king cast them, in the clay ground between Sukoth and Zarathan. And Solomon left all the vessels unweighed, because there were so many of them, the weight of the bronze was not ascertained. So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden ark, altar, the golden table for the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the south side, five on the north, before the inner sanctuary, the flowers, the lamps, and the tongs of gold, the cups, snuffers, basins, dishes for incense, and firepans of pure gold, and the sockets of gold, for the doors of the innermost part of the house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the nave of the temple. Thus all the work that King Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and stored them in the treasures of the house of the Lord. So far the word of the Lord. The inspired account details the temple's furnishings, indicating the care given to honor this beautiful place of worship. Solomon's magnificent temple with its furnishings, especially those relating to the sacrificial system, point to the coming Savior. Through Jesus' blood and merit, all of our sins are washed away. 
through the Savior's long-promised sacrifice. Forgiveness, life, and eternal salvation are ours. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Savior of the nations, dwell in my heart and make it a temple set apart for loving service to you. In your name I pray. Amen. We continue now to chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, entitled, The Ark Brought into the Temple. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priest and the Levites brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel, who had assembled before him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary. But they could not be seen from outside, and they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So far the word of the Lord. When the Levites bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, the cloud filling the Lord's house is nothing less than God's awesome presence. It is nothing less than his presence glory. God's presence reminds us of our unworthiness before him, yet it also announces his hallowing presence among us to cleanse us in his son Jesus. Let us pray. O oh Lord, I thank you for having shown your glory, not only by your presence in the temple of Jerusalem, but also especially in the person of your son, the Savior, our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. We continue now in chapter 8, verses 12 through 21, entitled, Solomon Blesses the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel. While all the assembly of Israel stood, and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised and his mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I choose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might, might be there. But I choose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made, for I have risen in the place of David my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, and there I have provided a place for the ark and which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So far the word of the Lord. Solomon recalls how the Lord had graciously kept his promises to his people. We too can look to the certainty of his promises. They declare God's law, promises to punish sin and disobedience, and his gospel promises of deliverance, mercy, and forgiveness in Christ. Let us pray. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, I come before you with a deep sense of unworthiness 
And I also trust fully in your gracious promise of forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We continue now in chapter 8 at verse 22, titled Solomon's Prayer of Dedication. <clears throat> then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept who have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant, David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Yet have, re yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God. Listen to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, My name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place, and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, and listen in heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in his house, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. When your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, and if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, if they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. When you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. If there is famine in the land, if there is pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and stretching out his hands toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you gave to our fathers. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, by whatever way you shall send them, and they and they pray to the Lord toward the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen, 
and the house that I have built for your name, that here in heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive that they may have compassion on them for they are your people and your heritage which you brought out of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. Let your eyes be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel giving ear to them whenever they call to you for you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your heritage, as you declared through Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. So far the word of the Lord. Solomon's lengthy prayer at the temple's dedication is a model of devotion to God, and it is a model of reliance upon the Lord. Although God dwells in heaven, he has chosen to come and bless his people with his presence. God recognizes our weakness. In Solomon's word, words, there is no one who does not sin. God also mercifully hears our prayers for help, and he comes to us and delivers us by his great power and by his great love. Let us pray. O merciful Father, you have chosen to come among us and bless us with the priceless gifts of faith, hope, and love. For this we thank and praise you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We now continue in chapter 8, verses 54 through 61, entitled Solomon's Sacrifices. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. Solomon offered his peace offerings to the Lord, 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. The same day the king consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat pieces of the peace offerings. Because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat pieces of the peace offerings, so Solomon held the feast at that time, and all Israel with him, a great assembly from Libo Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God seven days. On the eighth day he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went to their homes joyfully, and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David his servant, and to Israel his people. So far the word of the Lord. The solemn dedication of the temple ends with the awesome sacrifice of thousands and thousands of animals and with a feast celebrated <coughs> excuse me celebrated by the entire nation of Israel. The thousands of sacrifices at the temple prefigure the one sacrifice when Jesus Christ, the great high priest, offered his life for the sins of the world. We offer our lives as living sacrifices for our Lord and Savior, having received the priceless gift of salvation from and through him. We pray, O loving Savior, thousand, thousand thanks are yours for the great sacrifice you made on the cross for the sins of the world. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> And now lastly for today from God's holy word, 1 Kings chapter 9, the first nine verses entitled, The Lord Appears to Solomon. <coughs> Excuse me. As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if you turn aside from following me 
you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them. And the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight, and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. And this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss, and they will say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster upon them. So far the word of the Lord. God appears to Solomon a second time to emphasize the promises and the demands of the covenant with David's house. God's promises of blessings and threats of powerful judgment proclaim the law and the gospel. The law and the gospel still apply to us today. The law calls us to repentance and faithfulness. The gospel calls us to true faith, blessing, and comfort for now and for all eternity. Let us pray. O Lord, keep us from turning away from you and from bringing judgment upon ourselves. Forgive our sins, renew us, and strengthen us for a life of service. In Jesus' name, amen. And lastly for today, 1 Kings chapter 9, beginning at verse 10, entitled Solomon's Other Acts. At the end of 20 years in which Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Hiram, king of Tyre, had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress timber and gold as much as he desired, King Solomon gave to Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. But when Hiram came from Tyre to see the cities that Solomon had given him, they did not please him. Therefore he said, What kind of cities are these that you have given me, my brother? So they are called the land of Kabul to this day. Hiram had sent to the king 120 talents of gold. And this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon drafted to build the house of the Lord in his own house, and the Milo, and the wall of Jerusalem, and Hazor, and Megiddo, and Gezer. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire and had killed the Canaanites who lived in the city and, gave, and had given it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer, Gezer. and lower Beth Horan and Balath and Temar in the wilderness in the land of Judah and all the store cities that Solomon had in the cities for his chariots and the cities for his horsemen and whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem in Lebanon and in all the land of his dominion. All the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites who were not of the people of Israel their descendants who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel were unable to devout, devote to destruction. These Solomon drafted to be slaves, and so they are to this day. But of the people of Israel, Solomon made no slaves. They were the soldiers. They were his officials, his commanders, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. These were the chief officers who were over Solomon's work. 550 who had charge of the people who carried on the work. But Pharaoh's daughter went up from the city of David to her own house that Solomon had built for her. Then he built the Milo. Three times a year Solomon used to offer up burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar that he built to the Lord, making offerings with it before the Lord. So he finished the house. King Solomon built a fleet of ships at Ezion, Geber, which is near Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent with the fleet his servant seamen, who were familiar with the sea, together with the servants of Solomon. And they went to Ophir, and brought, him, brought from there gold, 420 talents, and they brought it to King Solomon. So far the word of the Lord. Hiram feels cheated in his agreement with Solomon and the king's glorious building projects included forced labor. The record of Solomon's acts are a mixture of faithful service to God and sinful greed and self-service. 
Our lives, too, are a record of sin along with our attempts to serve the Lord. That is why we daily need a renewal through the cross of Jesus, in whom we are a new creation and in whom we are dedicated to godly service. Let us pray. O Lord of the nations, teach us to place our trust not in earthly governments and rulers, but in your perfect power and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Having heard the word, now we continue in prayer using the Pray For Us calendar and the weekly prayers of the church. O Lord, on this 17th day of August, we pray that God would raise up in our own time faithful pastors and church workers who will preach Jesus Christ crucified and risen for the edification of his people and for the sake of those not yet of the faith. In your name we pray. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in the world, for unity and concord within the church, for harmony, patience, and love within the family, and for all that contributes to the common good, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For protection against acts of violence and terror, for just and fair laws, for good order, and for all to enjoy safety in their homes and freedom from want, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For schools, colleges, universities, and every other place where people gather to teach and to learn, for the wisdom of God's word to guide our knowledge of his creation, and for the flourishing of all arts and music, science and technology, to benefit all people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O merciful Father, you have wounded your own son to bring us the eternal healing of your love. Bless the sick and those who suffer those wounded in body or mind, and those dying, and all those we now name to you in our hearts. In your own time, grant to them healing according to your will, and sustain them into the day of the resurrection of the body. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, O Lord, and whatever else you know we need, we pray you to grant us for the sake of the mercies and by the merits of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are bold to pray together as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.